Come on in here, Let's brother. <laughs> yes, Tower is my real name. Uh, it was funny, as a basketball player, you know, you have your name on the back of your jersey, and people would be like, why do you get your nickname? And I have to have, like, Jones. And I'm like, no, Tower's my actual name. So uh, Pearlside, it's so good to be with you again. Uh, this is our third time here, and it's always a treat to be back with the family. Um, you're an amazing church. You truly, truly are. And um, your pastors are amazing as well. I have the utmost respect for Pastor Billy, his beautiful wife, and the rest of the team. In fact, Jennifer and I, we ask each other weird questions all the time and like just making small talk and discussion. And we were talking just a couple days ago after we had gotten here. And I said, if you had to, if we were no longer leading our church and we had to go work for someone else in a different church, and we travel all over the world, so we have a wide sampling. If we couldn't lead our church, we had to go be a part of another church and work for somebody else, who would you pick? Where would you go? And we were both like, I would definitely go to Pearlside, and I would absolutely work for that man. I would follow him anywhere. Pastor Billy's a great leader. He's wise, <laughs> wise beyond his years. He's godly, not just when he's standing here in front of you. He's godly when you don't see him. His character is impeccable, and uh, he's a tremendous leader. Pearlside, you're in great hands. Uh, with Pastor Billy. As he mentioned, I played professional basketball. I was Shaq's backup, which means I didn't play very much early in my career. But after I left the Orlando Magic, I went and played for the Los Angeles Clippers. And when I was with the Clippers, it was when video games were just making the shift to being realistic and sort of, sort of lifelike. You know, prior to that, if you had a basketball game, it was just an upgraded version of like Pong, you know, with a square ball just sort of, beep, 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 you know, working in diagonals and things like that. But in 96, NBA Live came out, and they were going to make all the players as realistic as possible. So I'm now playing for the Clippers, but because I had played for Orlando, because I had sat for Orlando, there was no, like, they wanted to make me realistic, but they didn't know who I was. So they called out to the, Orla to the Clippers and said, okay, tell us about Tower so we can make his, his player as realistic as possible. And the Clippers, bless their heart, said, well, he's really slow, <laughs> and he's a great shooter. All right, great. So I get the video game. It was such an old game. <laughs> that may or may not be me, the big white guy up there in the corner doing nothing, <laughs> which... That is, a, that is my career in a nutshell. The big white guy standing there doing very little. Anyway, so I got the video game, and it, was, we didn't even have, it wasn't even on a console. It was You stuck it into your laptop. That's how old school this was. So I pop it in, and I'm immediately going right into the starting lineup, baby. I'm, not, I'm a bench warmer no more, and I'm going to go into starting lineup, and I'm going to shoot every time I get it. I'm not passing to anybody. I'm not setting any screens. I'm done rebounding. I'm done fouling. I'm just going to be like, you know, Steph Curry. So I pop it in, put me in the starting lineup, and the game starts, and the opening jump happens, and then the team starts going down this way. And when I say my guy was slow, <laughs> like I think they set the slow meter at zero. Because everybody goes that way, and my guy's like turning in slow motion. By the time I'm even facing this way, they've scored and went back that way. So I turn, and by the time I get turned this way, they're coming. I'm like, they're going, I'm, I'm in jeopardy of being stuck at half court and just not even facing where the action is. So I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just take the rest of the first quarter on my video game and just go to one end at least. So I, it took me almost a whole quarter to get all the way down here. So the start of the second quarter, I throw the ball into me. And I turn. And it takes forever. I mean, like I'm dragging an anchor forever to get down close enough to take a shot. And I'm like, I, I'm going to score like three points total because it's just taking the entire game. I'm so slow. So eventually I'm like, close enough. And I push shot. Boom, made it. So then I run all the way down to the end. I eventually throw it into myself and I turn. And I'm like, ah, I just, like, this is, this is agony. So I take like two dribbles and then I shoot. And I made it. Let me tell you, 
If they put me at zero on speed, they put me at 100 on shooting. So I suddenly realize I don't need to waste my time going down there. I throw it into myself and I turn and then I just shoot at full court and I made it every time. <laughs> but because I wanted more points, I, I, I just had this thought of like, gosh, it's taking me so long to turn around. So I threw it into myself and shot this way and it went back and went <laughs> every time. Hey, I played a whole season. I averaged like 58 points a game. I mean, I'm just shooting every shot. Woom, woom. I don't have to move. Doesn't matter how slow I am. I mean, it was great until it got just kind of dull, right? Because at some point, catch and just throw it. We're in the miracle series. And hopefully what we're doing in the miracle series is getting an accurate picture of Jesus, not, not, not an avatar, not a caricature of who he is. Because the reality is, two months ago when we walked in and started this series, some of you had your understanding of God doing miracles today at zero, right? And there was an understanding of like, that sort of happened in those days, but it's not, you know, it's not what God does now. And I hope as you've been working through this, we don't have sort of a all or nothing perspective of who Jesus is, that he does, in fact, do miracles. Some of you might have had your miracle meter with Jesus at 100. And you can find yourself actually disillusioned that he doesn't do what you want him to do exactly when he said and exactly the way that you thought. If it's at zero, we can feel hopeless. If it's at 100, we can feel disillusioned. And we're trying to give you a really accurate picture of a God who, in fact, does miracles today, but he does them how he wants so that his kingdom can be extended in the earth. As we work through, uh, bring this series to a conclusion today, we're going to look at one sort of last facet of miracles. And it's not just that Jesus did miracles, but that God is still doing miracles today, and he's doing it through everyday ordinary people in everyday ordinary situations. God is still the one who does miracles, but honestly, he uses you and I to do it. You've been working through the Gospel of John. Today, we're going to actually be in the uh, slide over into the book of Acts. Acts was written by a writer named Luke. And in this account, in Acts chapter 3, we see Luke telling a story about two of Jesus' closest friends, a guy named Peter and a guy named John. Let's pick it up in Acts chapter 3. We'll read verses 1 through 10. Acts 3, starting in verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man, crippled from birth, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg for, from those who were going to the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Here in Acts chapter 3, we see a church that's just come through a, a type of transition. You know, Jesus had been gathering people for the past three years, and they were, they were following him, and now he's ascended. He's sort of the founder of this movement, and he's, he's passed it off to the next generation of leaders to take this to another place. Transitions can be dangerous times, but they're actually times when God tends to move in extraordinary ways. And what's happening here in this scripture is not unlike where we are at Pearlside with a, an incredible transition that's taken place. And Pearlside, you are poised for a move of God. Because God desiring for, for the people he gathers to move forward, he does extraordinary moments in times of transition, both to establish the new leadership and to affirm the, the stability of the people. And we, we see this happening here as Peter and John 
kind of take the leadership here of this new group called The Way. And it tells us here in verse 1 that one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. They're going to church. At the risk of stating the obvious to people who are sitting in church, it's important to go to church. It's important that you're part of a small group. It's important that you jump into the growth track. It's important that there's a group of people that can count on you being here and that you can count on them. It's important to go to church. But Peter and John weren't yet at church. They're on their way, but they're not there yet, and God does a miracle before they're inside, which means that miracles can certainly happen here on a Sunday. They can certainly happen in your small group, but let me tell you, they can also happen on a Tuesday evening on a college campus. Miracles can happen outside of church. They can happen while you're standing in line at Foodland. They can happen after you work your way out of the surf on the North Shore. God can do miracles, and he doesn't have to reserve himself to Sunday morning in a certain location. All he needs is someone that's willing to believe him and to step out in faith. Pearlside, be watching for God to move. He's going to do things in your midst that would blow your mind if he told you right now. Goes on in verse 2 and says, Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. His friends would carry him. Gosh, it's good to have good people in your life, isn't it? It's good to have helpful people in your life. But make no mistake, even the best of people can only carry you so far. We know from Acts chapter 4 that this particular man was 40 years old, and he couldn't walk from birth. So for 40 years, somebody had been doing something for him that he could not do himself. These are incredibly loyal friends. These are incredibly helpful people, but even the best of people in your life cannot do for you everything that you need. At best, they can only do things that are temporary and need redone again the next day until Jesus intervenes in this man's life. When Jesus gets involved, permanent change starts to happen. Every day, this man's friends helped him. But when Jesus shows up, he's now able to help himself. It goes on in verse 3. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as John did. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. The man asked him for money. How often do we ask God for something that is so much less than he's willing to give us? In fact, how often do we rate God or judge God on how well he gives us something that we're asking for that is so much less than he died to be able to give to us? How often do we come to God with a request about a job or relationship or relief from a situation and when he doesn't deliver it the way we want it, we get frustrated with him or we want to rate him or we want to judge him when what he doesn't just want to do is give us something small. He wants to transform the totality of our life. Peter and John said to this man, look at us. And Pearl said, I believe God wants us to take a fresh look at him today. To, to look at him anew, to gaze upon him and to start to see Jesus in this day and age, for who he actually really is. And it said the man gave them his attention because he was expecting to get something from him. The man had expectation. Faith and expectation are the keys to experiencing Jesus fully. Oftentimes, when we're wondering if God is going to do something, if God's going to move in our midst, it tends to have to do with either is he capable or is he willing? 
Is he capable? Does God have the power to intervene in this situation? Does God have the ability to do what he says? And even if he does have the ability, does he have the disposition to do it? Is he willing to do it? Is he compassionate enough? Does he see? Because you can have power, but no willingness, or you can have all the willingness in the world, but not the power. And what we see with this man's expectation, what I'm hoping through this miracle series, the rise of our expectation is we have a God who is both powerful and merciful. He's got the strength and he has the compassion. He has the ability and he has the willingness. And we can walk with faith and expectation in front of this God. Goes on, goes on in verse six and says, then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have, I give to you. Peter is not saying, oh, I know you want some money, but dang it, I left my wallet in the car. Or, you know what, bro, I'd give you some, but I, I don't have any, but you know what, since I don't have any money, uh, I don't know, hey, can I pray for you? That, that, that's not what's happening here. He's hearing this man and saying, yeah, gold and silver, that, that, that's nice, <laughs> but let me give you the real deal. What you're asking of me is not what's actually gonna change your situation. You're asking me for something that's gonna actually continue and perpetuate the situation. You'll be back here tomorrow asking the same thing. Why would I give to you so much less of something that God wants to do in you. So it's not a pauper mentality, it's a ha, 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 you think, bro, you're asking for the right thing. Let me help you out. Compared to the name of Jesus, nothing else can come close. Now listen to what he's saying. Gold and silver, I don't have. Now, gold's nice. Gold has some value. I wouldn't mind a little more gold. Silver I don't have. Those are incredibly valuable treasures in our society, but he's literally saying, I'm not gonna give you the most valuable things that you think exist. I'm gonna give you something that is of infinitely more value because compared to the name of Jesus, nothing else is more valuable because nothing else is more powerful. So he prays for him. Now, you might subtly be wondering, is that guy trying to nudge me to like pray for people and go for miracles? Let me just put your mind at ease and be crystal clear. That is exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> and if it's been subtle, I'm not doing my job well. Go for it. Go for it. You have a God who is able and you have a God who is willing and he just might do something incredible on this island. Now I know, I get it. When you feel somebody saying, hey man, go out there and ask God for miracles in front of people. I know the feeling that starts that, that, that tightness of chest and the shortness of breath and the sweaty palms that all circle this thought of, I don't know if I want to do that because what if God doesn't answer? What if he does? What if he does? There's a man in our church named Bob. Just basic Bob. Plain old Bob. There's nothing extraordinary about him. He's just a regular guy that attends our church. About the only thing extraordinary about him is he was deaf in his right ear from a diving accident, and he was, had zero hearing in his right ear for 40 years, 40. Couldn't hear a thing, medically confirmed. We had a little class thing that was happening in our church a few months ago. And in it, we were trying to you know, encourage people to pray for one another, and it was a group of people that aren't your typical sort of prayer warriors, you know? The idea of like praying out loud was was, was a stretch for them. And there was one lady in particular that we said, hey, here's what we want to do. Just pick somebody in here and just go pray for them. 
And this lady had never prayed out loud in front of anybody before, so she picked praying for Bob because he's harmless. So she went over to pray for Bob, and Bob, is there anything you'd like me to pray for? And Bob was struggling with some kidney. He was in the early stage of kidney failure, and he was having some heart issues and said, hey, could you pray that God would heal me? And she's like, okay, well, I've never really prayed out loud and said, God, would you heal him? And in the process of this lady who was nervous about praying out loud, praying for Bob, Bob got full hearing back in his right ear. Full. He went back to his ear doctor, and the guy said, I don't know how to tell you how that works, but you have full hearing. He looked at all the structural things that were, got blown out in his diving accident. None of those got reconnected, but his hearing works. And he does the test, you know, with beep, beep, and he got 100% from a scared little old lady. <laughs> we were in Cuba not too long ago on a mission trip. And we were preaching in some house churches, and, and there was this, just this precious old woman of God that was there, this Cuban lady. And, and at the end of preaching, we're like, hey, you know, can we pray for you for anything? And she said, would you pray for my ankles? They're really swollen, and they hurt. And we looked, and her ankles, I kid you not, were this big around. They were bigger than her calf. Huge. And I was there with a college student who had never really prayed for anybody before, and she said, what are we going to do? And I said, I'm, I can tell you what you're going to do. <laughs> I said, go pray for her. And she goes, I, I don't know how to pray. And I said, well, just, just walk up and look at her ankles and say, ankles shrink in Jesus' name. And she's like, oh. And she walked over and said, in the name of Jesus, ankles shrink. And nine of us sat there and watched those ankles shrink like that to bone, bone skinny. Well, I'm like, hey, ask God to put a little meat back on them. <laughs> I mean, they were like, <laughs> like too thin, right? I mean, they're going to get a little wobbly there. <laughs> what if God does answer? And you might be thinking, well, Pastor Keith, you only told us two. I could tell you dozens. But does God do that every time? No. But I actually don't remember the times that he didn't. I'm sure there's been plenty, and the worst thing that happens is somebody gets blessed by us noticing and caring enough to appeal to our God. That's all. That's not a bad if God doesn't. Most people are dying to be noticed and seen and cared for and cared about. But what if he does? Now, you might be sitting in here thinking, Okay, that's nice, like go pray for people and see miracles. But I actually walked in here kind of in need of one. I mean, it's nice that, of course, everybody else in here is the Peter and John in this story, but I feel a whole lot more like the beggar. I feel like the person in great need. Well, let's, let's shift perspective for just a little bit and look from his lens. In verse 7, it says, taking him by the right hand, so Peter taking this beggar by the right hand. He helped him up, and look at this. Instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. Instantly strong. Instantly strong. Instantly, in his feet and his ankles, he became strong. My friends, God has the ability to move directly into your, pace, your place of pain. God has the ability to intervene and bring strength directly into your place of brokenness. God has the ability to bring strength and healing instantly into your place of dysfunction. Instantly. Not like, you know, his headache went away. He went right to the source of the man's problem. It's the God that we serve. And if you find yourself in here today in any place of stuckness, dysfunction or brokenness or pain, you serve a God who can and is willing to bring strength and intervention immediately to that spot. If you find yourself in here racked, maybe you walked in and your soul is just troubled with insecurity, I want you to know that in Jesus, you can find all the security you need. If you walk in here and you find yourself struggling with loneliness, know that in Jesus, you can find one who says he'll stick closer than a brother. If you find yourself walking in here and that rejection just kind of rears its ugly head around you, you have one who literally 
laid down his life for you to be accepted. If you find yourself in a place of physical pain this morning, you clearly see from this text you have a God, even after Jesus has ascended to the Father, who does physical miracles. The answer for the situations that we find ourselves in that hurt us deeply are not found in the silver and gold, if you will, of this world. They're not found in conventional wisdom. Insecurity isn't driven away by taking a, 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 a temporal approach to it where you just compare yourself to somebody who's not as well off and for a moment you feel big, right, or, or posturing and posing. That, that might feel good for a moment. It might be gold for a day until you turn around and find one who's further ahead than you and you immediately feel insignificant, insecure again. The permanent answer is not found in the silver and gold of the day if you find yourself struggling with loneliness. Just getting a new boyfriend or girlfriend doesn't solve it. It might for a little bit. Just putting yourself out there a little bit more. It might work for a little bit. But when I turn to the silver and gold of the day rather than a permanent solution in Jesus, I might find myself, yes, with a companion, but then to maintain that companionship, I might find myself where I've got to compromise some things to keep them around. And as valuable as silver and gold is, it doesn't work. The silver and gold of rejection is that we just sort of put on a, put on a mask, right? And we, we pretend we're somebody. And in the process of pretending we're somebody, people might like us better. Or if they don't, well, it's, it doesn't hit the heart. It just sort of hits the mask. Like, it's okay if you don't like me. It's okay if you turn from me. It's okay if you betray me because you're not really betraying my heart. You're betraying my facade. So it temporarily, at least for the day, for the moment, can give me a little bit of protection. But the reality is, what if they like the mask? Now you actually find yourself feeling twice as rejected because they're around you, but they don't even know who you are. The silver and gold, the temporary things, no matter how useful they might be in a moment, they don't last. But when you and I ask of Jesus, he comes into those places that we're trying to bring solution and relief. He comes into those and brings strong immediately. Instant power. Our God is awesome. So whether I'm in the place of needing to sort of receive like the beggar, whether I'm in the place of doing pretty good and maybe I could extend God's goodness, either way, what you and I have access to and available to us is far better than gold. And it is more necessary to this world than it's ever been before. It goes on in verse 8. It says that he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. I love that. Jumped to his feet. What do you do when God's done something amazing on your behalf? What do you do? You know, you don't have to try to pay for it. You, you didn't earn God doing something amazing in the first place. He's not doing it because of something you've done, so you don't, have to, you don't have to pay him for it. Any more than when I decide as a father to bless my children with something good, I just, I just give it to them. And the, the best thing they can do is not to try to retroactively earn what I just did. It's to enjoy what I've given them, to utilize it. We see from this man, and it should be for us, what do we do when God has done something amazing on our behalf? Well, for him, it should, and for us, it should inspire worship. It should inspire thanksgiving. It says that he went into the courts praising God. And he didn't just sort of walk in. The text says that he was walking and jumping. We should use, we should be inspired to use the new freedom or the new security or the new power that God has given us. Use it. The man walked and he wasn't just sort of walking. It says that he was jumping. 
So he was probably like, walk in, right? I mean, my man is strutting. He's probably walking backward. He's probably moonwalking. Like he's doing all kinds of things he's never done in 40 years with his legs. He's jumping around. God has put strength where he didn't have it, and he is leaping for joy. When God does something inside of you, my friends, it should show on the outside. This guy's jumping when God delivers you, when God sets you free, when the power of Jesus does what silver and gold can't do. It ought to inspire something out of us that doesn't look like obligation. Okay, I'll show up. All right, the song says lift your hands. I guess I will. No, when I have walked in bondage like I'm wrapped and chained and the power of God breaks those off of me. You better believe I'm gonna do with that freedom what I never could do when I was bound. Please don't be a Christian who squanders what God's doing in you. It goes on in verse nine. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And I love this. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. You see the impact of a miracle? They were filled with wonder and amazement. You might be tempted to say, well, I can't do a miracle. I mean, after all, that miracle was done by Peter and John. I mean, a couple of the big dogs of the faith, right? But I would venture to tell you that at this point in time, they weren't the Apostle Peter and the Apostle John. They hadn't written the Bible yet. This is Peter and John, two retired fishermen who were friends of Jesus. That's it. They're a military person stationed on Oahu that's a friend of Jesus. They're a guy that rides a Harley on a weekend that's a friend of Jesus. They're a professor. It's a friend of Jesus. This isn't Peter and John, the headliners. They're average retired blue-collar guys, but they were friends of Jesus. Now, you might be tempted to go, I know, I get it, but it's still, maybe God just did it through them so that we'd have something amazing to read about in Scripture. I get the temptation, but look at what it says. They were, people were filled with wonder and amazement at what? At what happened to him? Who's him? We, we don't know. We don't even know the guy's name. All we know is that people walked past him and didn't notice him for 40 years. Now you're in good company. You might not think you're Peter or John, but you might feel unnamed at times. You might feel unseen at times. You might feel unnoticed at times. You might feel dysfunctional with a jacked up life for 40 years at times. And it is the transformation in that man that led to the wonder and amazement, which means everyone across the sanctuary or watching online is in a position that allowing God to impact you can begin to impact others. Come on, somebody. This dude had known the power of God for literally seconds. Immediately, God did something in him, and now through what God did in him, immediately a bunch of other people are having wonder and amazement. He didn't even know scripture yet. He hadn't even gone to seminary yet. He hadn't even been ordained yet. This man is immediately healed and immediately in the game. What about you? You're waiting to impact others so you can preach like Pastor Billy. My friends, you'll never preach that good. That man preaches gold. But what you have is actually more valuable than gold. You have the fact that God impacted your life. And when he impacts your life, go and let people be amazed. You don't have to know it all. I, I, was, I was very newly 
When I say newly, I mean like barely saved. I'm not even sure that I was saved. I was mostly saved. Gave my life to Jesus. I grew up not knowing God, didn't know anything about him. I grew up nominally Catholic, so I knew a couple like prayers that you kind of memorize, but that was about it. I was in my fourth year in the NBA playing for the Milwaukee Bucks. I teammate shared the gospel with me, and I blew my mind, and I gave my life to Jesus, and he just immediately just started doing stuff that on the inside of me that I didn't even know. And for the first time, somewhere in this brand new salvation stage, I, I went to the place where some people were praying, and I was so amazed, because they were praying like the Bible, like God, as you say in your word, and they're praying scripture, and I'm going, this is awesome. It was incredibly impactful for me. I didn't know any scripture, <laughs> but I was impacted by how they did. And then a couple days later, I was watching a heavyweight championship fight with Evander Holyfield. Remember him? And he was coming into the ring, and he had on the robe, on, like stitched into his robe, Phil 4, colon 13. I'm like, I wonder what that means. And I'm like, I think that's the Bible. I've seen it kind of written like that before. I know nothing. So I start flipping through. Where's Phil? Who's Phil? And then I find something that's close. It's Philippians. And I go to Philippians 4.13, and I read this incredible verse. Like, it's the first verse I actually found on my own. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And I'm watching the heavyweight champion of the world walk in ready to do all things through Christ who gives him strength. And I'm like, that is amazing. That's an awesome verse. The Bible's great. God loves sports. I'm so excited. <laughs> A couple days after that, I found myself at another prayer meeting. Me who knows nothing about anything about the Bible, but I do know Phil 413, baby. So I'm just doing what I saw some other guys do. And I, there's a guy, and I said, hey, man, can I pray for you? And he goes, yeah, you sure can. And I'm like, oh, God, as you say in the book of Philistines. <laughs> if you're not laughing, that's the bad guys in the Old Testament. <laughs> it's not the Philippians. It's, it's the bad guys. I don't even know who the Philist. I don't know a Philistine from a Philippian. And I prayed, this brother can do all things through God who gives him strength. At the end of this moment, he looks at me and goes, gosh, that impacted me deeply. <laughs> he doesn't know a Philistine either. It's like, like, I think God's real. I'm like, I know. And he's powerful. And you don't have to know anything other than that to be an impact player. This guy's going, you mean God cares? God can strengthen me up like crazy, right? Yes. Even if you don't know all the right words. Because human transformation from death to life, from darkness to light, from broken to whole, that is a supernatural process. It's supernatural. And you and I just simply, if we want to see miracles, just let that supernatural ha process happen to you and let that supernatural process shine through you. In Pearlside, let me just challenge you with this. Just go be proof of God's goodness. Go be proof of God's goodness. And in his name, Go do some miracles. Father, I thank you that you love your sons and daughters more than they have any notion because your love is mind-blowing. Your goodness toward us is mind-blowing. And yet, God, you don't just love us. Somehow you call us to be a part of this plan of letting others know how great you are. I pray through this entire series that faith an expectation and a second look and an accurate understanding of your desire and your willingness and your capability to do miracles would just settle deep in the hearts of every person listening. And that God, they would walk out of here and their communities and the city would never be the same as you move 
like only you can. Have your way. In Jesus' name.